whole idea of this corridor was more political consideration than a strategic consideration. Why I say political is that you want the summit to finish with a bang. For all practical purposes, it is gone. Now, whatever little there was left, this India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor is a death nail to China. An average iPhone being produced in India, it takes 15% more labor, the whole production cost, than the one being produced in China will have to choose and when India is pushed to choose, it will sacrifice international north-south corridor like it has sacrificed the Chabahar and it will side with whatever the port America is interested in, whatever the transit corridor America is interested in. Hello and welcome to Infra Talks, a podcast where we put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Today I'm joined by a journalist from New Delhi who has covered the region of Middle East and South Asia, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey. My guest today, Saurabh Kumar Shahi, will speak on India's engagement in Iran, G20 summit, and the India-Middle East-Europe Economic Corridor. Saurabh, welcome to Infer Talks. Thanks for inviting me. All right, Saurabh, let's start our conversation. And my very first question is about the write-up that you wrote about uh, India holding the G20 summit. And you go on to actually criticize the announcement about the India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor in that very write-up. You know, a lot of commentators have actually said that the transit trade route will cut down the time from the existing 10 days, sorry, from existing 17 days down to 10 days. Why would you call it as such where the benefits are so obvious. Look, uh, see, my criticism uh, mostly starts with the fact that uh, the entire thing was undercooked. Why I say it is undercooked is that there needs to be a proper uh, research, a proper uh, project report, which should come in public first, and then there should be experts who should be invited to to debate about it, to, to put their uh, recommendations, to um, uh, register their uh, uh, protest and things like that. Now, this entire thing was so undercooked that um, I think probably, except for New Delhi, none of the partners were as enthusiastic about uh, uh, this whole thing being announced at this summit um, as New Delhi was. And this became evident from the fact that if you look at the domestic uh, media in the other countries involved in this entire thing, there was nothing in the run-up to, uh, to the summit. Not only there was nothing in the run-up to the summit, uh, if you look at the coverage which has happened post summit, uh, you will realize that this is just, uh, uh, you know, prepping up the talking points and there are no detailed reports, detailed conversation around the whole. Thing. That is why I'm saying that uh, uh, the whole idea of this corridor was more um, a political consideration than a strategic consideration. Why I say political is that uh, you want to, you want the summit to finish with a bang. And considering the, the other parts of the summit where the defense minister of different countries came or the uh, foreign minister of the uh, participant countries came, uh, because we could not end up uh, releasing a joint statement, there was an actual fear that we might not be able to do it even in the main meeting, uh, the head of the states were participating. Now, at least that was started and there was a, a joint uh, communique which was released uh, following the meeting. Uh, but apart from that, because that fear was there, I think um, uh, it was a political decision to announce something, something so that, uh, you know, uh, the summit would look um, as a success for the domestic audience. And I, uh, time, and, time and again, I say that this is uh, basically a theater for the domestic audience, not for the world audience. Because outside of India, the enthusiasm regarding this project, um, I, do, I, I did not find that kind of enthusiasm. The reason is, if you look at the, uh, the economic aspect of it, uh, it scarcely makes sense. I'll tell you why. Uh, of course, there's a lot of talk about you know reducing uh, 70 days uh, to 10 days and things like that. But th these are just you know back of the napkin calculations. You don't know that. What you are doing is that you are trying to just add up whatever time different legs of this project. Say, for example, a container is moving from the Gujarat port, uh, from a port in Gujarat to, uh, say, UAE. Now, we're adding that whatever days, five days, 
and they were adding how much time it takes from UAE to Saudi, and then probably from there to to Israel, and then from there to Greece. You are just adding up those whatever three days, four days, three days, two days, and they have come at a, a conclusion that um, the resultant. Uh, number will be 10 days, which is 7 days less than the 17 days it takes as of now from a container uh, to leave the port of Gujarat or uh, Bombay or, or other ports in Maharashtra and then uh, reach the first uh, landing port in Europe. Now, this is a very, um, uh, you know, in absence of a better word, this is a very hilarious, uh, con uh, you know, the way of uh, calculating the days is very hilarious. You don't just add up days like that, because in terms of uh, when you talk about um, container ships, there there is a lot of things involved. For example, if the container reaches uh, UAE, how much time does it take in UAE for that container to be unloaded and then put on a railway or a roadway, whichever uh, decision they take, railway, for example? That time we are talking about where you transfer the containers from one uh, mode of transport to another mode of transport is not an easy thing. Very, very, very few countries in the world have managed to make it seamless. China has managed to make it seamless. At some places, Korea has managed to, uh, South Korea has managed to make it seamless. But there are not many countries. This is the reason why sea transport, the marine transport is being uh, you know, there will always be people who will say otherwise, but marine transport is the preferred trans mode of transportation for the commodities in the entire world because it is seamless and it is cheaper. Let's come to the price point. I, I wanted to in interrupt you over here and sorry for that, but I wanted to ask you, you said that, you know, some government ministry in India itself would have been responsible for carrying out the feasibility study first. Had that been the case, are you also suggesting that India should have carried out some kind of a feasibility with other partner countries to ascertain how much time would it have actually taken had the necessary infrastructure and all that needs to be done had been taken care of, would have then taken this much amount of days to get a cargo from destination A in India all the way to its destined target in Europe? Yeah, that's the point. You need to do it first. You cannot announce a project and then decide in a retrograde effect that we are going to reduce the days from 17 to 10. There was just one paper by one think tank, which also did not do a DPR. It was just a paper, like, you know, cutting, pasting different, uh, uh, as I said, different legs of the uh, and thing. Which, that, and which think tank was this? There was, uh, I forgot the name, there was one think tank in, uh, in, in the U.S., which had made a paper, I think, uh, last year in July, and they used some of the data from that uh, paper. It was an individual paper made by individuals, not a detailed report. And uh, I'll send you the I'll send you the paper. You can put it in the in the link uh, for the audience. Uh, that that's the point. Now these things are not easy. For example, different railways use different gauges in this area. Now you have to create a whole a whole new railway line from UAE till all the way to, to Saudi Arabia and to that railway line should have the same God where you don't have to then break the journey between the land part of the whole uh, thing. Now, there are not many countries in the world who have made that kind of railway in the desert. Where is the know-how? China has. So you think China will participate in making a railway which is uh, uh, for a, uh, um, a transit corridor which is in direct competition to the transit corridor which China is making? Which other country has done that? For example, Indian Railway is a good, um, you can say it is a good company, but it has not had the experience of doing it anywhere in the world. So there are many problems like this which should have been taken care of before announcing this project and which was not taken care of. This is not new. This is a new normal which we see here in India. And I was not very surprised by that. Now, no, Saurabh, you have actually went ahead and actually equated India's IMEC project, uh, you know, with its previous investments in other two projects. And these are you know, the North-South Transit Corridor and Jabahar Port. Uh, critics might think and say that, you know, you're being a sore anti-Modi critic uh, while suggesting that the project will be a non-starter, despite the fact when we have countries uh, from the region of the Gulf itself and India 
committing itself to making all the necessary investments. Look, uh, if you talk about the North-South Transit Corridor, all the countries involved there were also willing to make the same thing. They were willing to make the investment. Russia was willing to make the investment. Russia was very enthusiastic about it. India was also very enthusiastic about it. And in the case of Chabahar, for example, the two parties involved, Iran and India, both were very enthusiastic about it. The third party, which was Afghanistan, via which uh, you know they wanted to have a route to Central Asia, uh, even that party at that point in time was very interested. The, the whole idea is, it's not about interest. It is about, is there an economic rationale to it? Is there an economic um, argument for its uh, cons construction? No, there is no economic argument. I'll, I'll tell you what. Look at the international uh, north-south corridor. Even in that case, it was a corridor which would have connected India to Europe. It was going via Russia, but the products were not going to, to go just to Russia. It was going to go to the Europe. Now, this will only make sense if you have become a manufacturing powerhouse. Is India a manufacturing powerhouse? No, it is not. What people don't know is that in spite of all the push, in spite of all the, uh, you know, media, PR, on stop. The percentage of manufacturing in India's GDP is just stagnant for the last 10 years, which is the uh, which includes the nine years of the current uh, government in power. It is stagnant. It has not risen by even 0.1%. And when you say stagnant, what percentage is it of the entire total GDP? Around 22%. Manufacturing remains around 22 to 25% of the entire GDP. This, has, this number has remained same in the last 10 years. Now, if you're not a manufacturing... And this is yeah. despite the fact that the volume of the GDP itself has actually grown in rupee or dollar terms. Yeah, it has grown. It has grown um, substantially in, in the last nine years, although there was, uh, uh, because of uh, several other factors like demonetization and, and corona, it saw a dip. But of course, there is a... Uh, um, a definite growth which you see in the nine, nine year, but the percentage of manufacturing uh, in the whole GDP remains same. Now, this is something which is very interesting and this is something which many of the people don't even know. Now, unless you have not become a manufacturing superpower, what are you exporting to Europe? Why do you need a new corridor? The corridors the rationale behind corridors, the economic uh, uh, rationale behind corridors is simple, that you are a manufacturing superpower, you are a manufacturing powerhouse, you are sending the stuff to newer markets which, uh, to which there were, not, um, there were no corridors existing either. Now, if you are not a manufacturing superpower, what are you sending to Europe? What are you producing which you are sending to Europe? Of course, if, when China moves uh, up on the value chain, some of the industries have shifted. But if you look at it, these industries have shifted to uh, Vietnam, it has shifted to Thailand, it has shifted to Bangladesh, it has shifted to Mexico. And if you look at the percentage of manufacturing as part of their GDP, you will get the answer. You will see a very, very clear rise. For example, in the last, 15, uh, I think, 12 years, the per capita income of uh, Vietnam has gone by three times. Grown by three times. It is indicative that something is happening in the economy. And that something is that the lower in the value chain, those manufacturing have shifted. The same goes for uh, uh, Bangladesh. But if you look at the numbers in India, the numbers don't reflect this. Which means if you are not a manufacturing powerhouse, what are you going to, why do you need a new corridor? As far as exporting something to Middle East was concerned, it's a straight away uh, marine route. So what are you exporting? That brings me to the second point. If you look at the production cost, manufacturing, uh, the primary, um, if you look at the primary ingredients in a manufacturing thing, this is labor. Uh, raw material and the production cost. Now, just two days ago, there was this uh, uh, the news in, uh, with, about um, iPhone being manufactured in India. It says that 
an average iPhone being produced in India, it takes 15% more labor, uh, the whole production cost than the one being produced in China. As of now, because of the political consideration, iPhone is absorbing that 15% rise in the production cost. It is not passing it on to the consumer. Otherwise, your iPhone would have been 15% costlier. But sort of that 15% is actually being you know, absorbed for the very fact that the United States would not want to place all its egg in one basket, and that is China. You know, given the it's emphasis true. that is going on on technological de-risking and so much, you know, the US and especially Apple would say it's making a right move, despite the fact that, you know, it would end up costing it this much. True, true. But that, that's my point. That other basket is not India. That is my point. That other basket is Bangladesh. That other basket as of now is Vietnam. That other basket as of now is Mexico. That is my point. U.S. wants to put the eggs in other, uh, other baskets. They want, it wants to divide the eggs. But where it is putting the eggs? It is not in U.S.'s hands. See, the market takes its own course. If Vietnamese are more efficient, U.S. cannot do anything about it. The factories will go to Vietnam if they are more efficient, which they are. And in all these countries, if you look at uh, uh, China stayed with Vietnam, if you look at China stayed with Bangladesh, if you look at China stayed with even India, and if you look at China stayed to, to Mexico, in all these cases, as the export has grown from these countries to the West, the import has grown from China to these countries, which means that as of now, the raw materials and other essential items which are required for the manufacturing are still coming from China to these countries. And these countries are just value adding on, the, uh, on that and re-exporting it to US. In the US, you can be happy that this is not made in China, but for all practical purposes, this is made in China. This is a major problem which India is facing that as it wants to ramp up the manufacturing and be less dependent on China, the more it ramps up the manufacturing, the more it is being dependent on Chinese raw material. This is the most ironical situation. So my point is, in the case of, for example, uh, Chaba, it was a political decision. They wanted to bypass Pakistan. It was a political decision. They thought that, OK, uh, this will have you know, at least some desired political goals. But the moment the regime changed in Afghanistan, it has lost its value. That is why Chabahar is nothing. I mean, I was shocked when I reached Chabahar. But sort of before I come to Chabahar, so what you're basically suggesting is that the economic imperatives are not in place to make the proposed corridor a success, despite the fact that all the partners that you have, either from the Gulf and also the fact that, you know, India is willing to bring the much needed investment into it, it will still not yield the much needed purpose it's meant to serve. True. And so now let me come to the next question, and this is perhaps about China. We've recently seen China actually go ahead and, you know, mediate between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which ended up resulting in a much needed and a much awaited detente between the two countries. Uh, don't you think that detente itself might result in reducing that environment of zero-sum competition between the two countries and bring much needed stability in a region which has been rife with a lot of volatile, uh, sorry, with a lot of conflict over the years, then let me ask you, in that case, would not then the proposed India, Middle East, uh, Europe economic corridor be a much needed success or a much awaited success? Look, this argument does not even hold what I don't know uh, where this argument uh, came from. The whole idea of this corridor is that this is this is in competition with the BRI. Where did the participation of China comes in the picture? Saudi is having, look, Saudi is having a good relationship with China and, and China investing in the Middle East. China can invest in 30 other projects in the Middle East. This, the entire idea of this corridor, look, this corridor was not proposed by Saudi Arabia. 
This corridor was not proposed by UAE. This corridor was not proposed by Israel. This corridor was not proposed by even European Union. This corridor is the brainchild of US and India. And why would a corridor which is a brainchild of US and India will likely not have a zero-sum game when it comes to China? It will have a zero-sum game. It so is a competition with India. But sort of the fact is that, you know, China itself has made... I, I suppose in terms of the scale of investments in this year itself, UAE and Saudi Arabia happen to be among the top destinations where it's made investments under BRI. Uh, I'm not saying that it might end up becoming an active partner in a project like this, but given the political situation it has contributed to by you know brokering negotiations between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, don't you think it would create the much needed political environment at least in the region, in terms of, you know, a much awaited stability, for a project like this to be, you know, successful when successful when it actually materializes. Look, as far as the political environment is concerned, it is countries like Yemen, Iran. They will decide if the the region is uh, if there is a political stability or not. China can be a mediator. It is not a party. When a project is made in such a way that it is bypassing Iran, like if you look at it, it has been made primarily to bypass Iran and Russia. Then why would you think that a country like Iran will be very enthusiastic about such a project? China's investment in Middle East is separate from the corridor. It can invest in 50 different things and yet say that we are not part of the corridor. So China participating in the political stability of the region is a side show. It's not the main show. China is not party to the corridor. That is the point. The corridor has been built as a competition to China. Proposed that it's not built. Like another corridor they are pushing. See, the whole Build Back Better program which the US has initiated as a counterweight to BRR. This is part of the same idea. Why would China then participate in such a thing? China did not. See, China, even in the case of Chabahar, for example, China came and dangled the carrot much later when they realized that the, the investment from India is not materialized. Now, now let's, let's speak of Chabahar itself. In fact, you recently visited Chabahar port. You know, as a journalist, you've been to different countries. Chabahar was also one of the locations that you actually visited while you were visiting Iran. Let me then ask you, uh, you reported Iran's enthusiasm, its officials' enthusiasm to engage with India, given the fact that it does not really want to place all its eggs in one basket. And when I say one basket, or perhaps if I may be a little modest, I may say two baskets, that is China and Russia. Uh, the fact is, that, you know, we do not see the kind of interest and enthusiasm that India was once having for Chabahar itself, it seems to have waned or gone downhill. Why has that been the case? Again, when a project is more political and it has less economic rationale, it will never be successful. Why I am saying that this is not apple and oranges comparison is that I am seeing the repeat of it in the case of uh, this, this corridor to Europe. Even in the case of Chabahar, tell me what is the economic rationale? Chabahar as a poor was going to be a gateway to Central Asia and from there to Eurasia. Now, if you are again not a manufacturing hub, where is the market? Can Central Asia and Russia in itself, or say if you include the three countries in the Caucasus, are they a big market enough for to warrant a new corridor? No. See, the idea was from Afghanistan, because India was getting some of the contracts of mining contracts in the Western Afghanistan. The idea was that you know we will uh, get the raw materials from there and, and we can use the corridor and then we can export something to Afghanistan and then to Central Asia. Now, the problem is, once the government changed in Afghanistan, those projects were gone. 
which led to the complete killing of the Zahedan Railway. Look, one of the fulcrums of the entire Chabahar port thing was the railway uh, Zahedan Rail. That railway was going to a place from where it would have entered Afghanistan in future and this could have become a, a, a big economic, uh, you know, uh, sort of transit uh, uh, railway line from Afghanistan to uh, Chabahar port and from there on, on uh, shipping containers to India. Now, when that failed, Zahedan Railway failed. So India first pulled out of, out of the Zahedan Railway because now it had no uh, economic benefit from investing in that railway because nobody is going to Zahedan from India. Why would you invest in a railway to Zahedan? Zahedan Railway uh, made sense only when you had the mining contracts in Western Afghanistan. When you lost those contracts, when there was a regime change, that railway lost its value. India pulled out. When I went to put, what I was surprised was even at the port, if you look at the uh, Chabaha port, one of the terminals, the uh, Saeed Bahesti terminal uh, is one of the terminals which India uh, was awarded. And I was surprised that the only thing which I saw there were four cranes. Even those four cranes were, you know, still under wraps. Neither India was using it nor other uh, participating countries were using it. And there was nothing else. There, of course, there is a good office of, uh, you know, Port Authority and, and the Indian uh, Port Authority. But there was nothing else. Like once in 20, 30 days, one ship comes from there to India or goes to there. But this whole PR, uh, you know, exercise, which I, I first heard about Chab, India investing in Chaba, but you won't believe I was in school. I'm a, I'm 40 now. I was still in school when India started investing in China. And while the city has flourished and, you know, there are infrastructure, but those infrastructure were built by Iranians themselves, not the Indians. And of course, there is this, uh, what I was surprised by was that from the lowliest of the staff to the very high in Chabaha, everyone wanted India over China. Everyone wanted India over China. Wow. Because, because the, as I said, they, 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 they didn't want to put all the eggs in one basket. So they, they wanted that, you know, strategic uh, breathing space to, to maneuver in the future. You know, if push comes to shove. Every one of them, from the Port Authority, from the Chabahar, uh, you know, free economic zone, these are two different... Uh, uh, organizations managing two different aspects of it and these are uh, and what I was surprised were, was by the fact that these guys didn't even ask me uh, to use it off the record they were on the record scene. and so speaking of being on the record one of the officials actually suggested that they were willing to offer India a 25 year strategic deal similar to what Iran had actually offered to China uh, my question then is We've seen actually, you know, over the over the last few years, you've reported that India's imports from Iran, especially the oil imports, have virtually gone down to zero. So in that case, where do you then see the future of Chabahar itself? No, Chabahar is gone. For all practical purposes, it is gone. Now, whatever little there was left, this India uh, Middle East uh, Europe economic corridor is a death knell to Chabahar. I mean, the Indian investment to Chabahar. I'm not saying it's a death knell to Chabahar in itself. Of course, uh, the sanctions on, on, on Russia is, is a new, you can say, lifeline for Chabahar because that even if India is not a participant, the North-South corridor, Russia is very, uh, and Iran are both very, very enthusiastic about it. And if, if and when that corridor uh, comes into being, Chabahar will become the main fulcrum. So Chabahar itself is not dead, but India in Chabahar is as good as dead, as good as dead. See, they will keep saying um, you no know, platitudes and there will be some, you know, headline making announcements here and there, uh, but I don't see anything happening. That that thing is, is gone, is gone completely. But sort of given how pessimistic you have been about all the corridors so far, including the North-South Transit Corridor, you know, the, uh, the Chabahar port itself, are you then also suggesting or perhaps reaching to this conclusion that the India Middle East Europe economic corridor is perhaps going to meet the same fate?
Look, I am not I am not pessimistic about the, the North South corridor. I am pessimistic about India's participation in the North South. It's two different things. Because what has happened to Russia because of the the war in Ukraine, the sanctions and everything, it has given a new new, new lease of life to this uh, international North South corridor. And I see that this corridor is going to gain traction in days and months to come. How enthusiastic India would be to be party to that? Because look, as of now, India has has like capably balanced uh, its relationship with Russia and its relationship with the West as far as the, the war in, in Ukraine is concerned. But much of it is also to do with the fact that uh, that that America needs India in its uh, which it sees as a, its existential fight against China. It has provided India a cushion, that kind of cushion no other government in India ever had in the last whatever 75 80 years of independence. This has helped India as of now, but. Uh, in probably in another year and a half or two years, when this thing will come to boil, you will have to choose. And when India is pushed to choose, it will sacrifice international north-south corridor like it has sacrificed the Chabahar. And it will side with whatever the port America is interested in, whatever the transit corridor America is interested in. Then, this India's uh, you know, participation in, in North-South corridor will also become zero. That does not mean, as I said, North and South, North-South corridor uh, in itself does not have a value. It, it has a value and it is going to see some traction in, in uh, years to come. But India's participation will become zero. That's the difference. But do you think India will go you know, wholeheartedly into the IMEC uh, corridor itself as well in terms of making sure that it also translates into a successful corridor? unlike the previous ones. It will, go, it will go wholeheartedly, I'm sure. My only concern is it does not improve upon whatever we ha already have, which is the existing route, which is the existing route to Europe. It is not going to improve upon it, not improve upon substantially to negate the cost, the rise in the cost. Look, you have to understand, it might happen like that seven, 10 days from 17 days is, is, a, is a complete balloon. That is not going to happen. But it might happen that from 17 days, it might go down to 15 days. That is possible. But those two days which you have gained, is it worth the investment you are making, which, is, which, would, which would be in several billions of dollars first? And second, would those two days offset the additional production cost which every item will incur by sending it through this corridor? Why I'm saying this is that I'll give you an example. Marine corridor is the cheapest port of uh, marine uh, transportation is the cheapest mode of transportation in the world. Uh, one famous example is that when uh, uh, you produce iPhone in China, and when you send a shipload of iPhones to America, the, in, the cost for an individual iPhone, the total cost of shipment, is rounded off to zero. It is so less. Now. This won't be so less if you start sending that uh, iPhone from first from a sea corridor, from a sea based uh, transport to a land based, then to railway, then again to sea, then again to railway, which is the case going to happen with the India corridor. Then be, it will not be that efficient. And then that zero, which you rounded to zero, that will become whatever $2 or $5 or $7 or $1. I don't know. Now, if you achieve those two days of quick transportation to Europe, from 17 to say 15 days, is it worth it? Will it offset the additional cost you are in? That is my point. My entire uh, argument is based on the economic rationale. Now, before we wrap up, sort of my last question is basically about the statement after the decision and the announcement of the IMEC corridor itself. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan actually went ahead and rejected the corridor, saying that no corridor without Turkey would be possible. And if I may quote him, he said, we say that there is no corridor without Turkey. Turkey is backing its own project in Iraq, which is the Iraq Development Project, which aims to connect the Gulf countries along with Iraq to Turkey and Europe. 
he also suggested that countries such as Emirates and Qatar might also join in. Um, then my question is, given the ongoing stability and violence in Iraq already, do you think uh, such a corridor like that could pose a serious competition to the proposed uh, India-Middle East-Europe uh, economic corridor? Uh, look, there are two, two aspects here. Uh, let's first discuss the, the current security situation in Iraq. Um, I was recently in Iraq. I was there for 10 days. I visited uh, the southern part of the country and Baghdad and the area around Baghdad. And the situation has improved remarkably. It is not the same Iraq which we had two years ago or three years ago. Situation has improved. As far as the Sunni triangle is concerned, uh, you know, the Asuleman, um, Salauddin and uh, uh, Tikrit and uh, that region is concerned. Um, it has some uh, low intensity uh, insurgency, but it is not enough to, to mount any kind of strategic challenge to the current uh, government in Iraq. Uh, as far as this corridor is concerned, look, Turkey's uh, interest here is twofold. When it looks at the corridor passing through um, uh, Saudi Arabia and going uh, going to Europe, it also sees that it is landing at Greece, which is uh, which has been the traditional competitor of uh, or rival of, of Turkey. So the idea is Turkey has always wanted that any integration, Eurasian integration, should happen to Turkey and not through Greece because it will increase Greece's uh, role, is Greece's value in the whole European uh, uh, Union economic uh, infrastructure. As of now, Greece is a minion. It has no value as such in the economic, uh, if you look at the economic uh, infrastructure of Europe. Once this corridor happens, whether it is successful or not, Greece's um, importance will increase in the whole architecture. That is something which is an anathema for uh, Turkey because of the obvious uh, rivalry and the second is it also wants to rope in its partner uh, Qatar. Qatar also sees this corridor as as a threat. I mean, I won't say threat, but as something which is um, you know going to increase the profile of two of the countries which it does not get along with, which is UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, if Qatar and Turkey decides if they agree on this, that this corridor is a bad news and we need to have a parallel corridor. I don't think they can create a corridor, but I can very well see that they can create hindrance to this corridor. I don't think they are capable enough, Turkey and, and Qatar in itself, uh, to create a corridor. Uh, but I can see that they are capable enough to sabotage it or some sort of you know create situation which is not fruitful for this corridor so i see that i see this uh, more as a uh, you know more as a threat than a promise saurabh thank you so much for your time and you know for sharing your perspective on all these important issues that we wanted to discuss today thank you so much thank you for calling me thank you so much for staying with us through this conversation with mr saurabh kumar shahi our team works very hard to make this work possible, and it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content. And if you'd like to stay informed on upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.